also interested about the way, Steph, that you were saying, no, this wasn't about drugs, especially when we're talking about the, um, the caterpillar. Oh, so not necessarily about drugs. Well, we, our next speaker is going to be... Spe <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you. Oh, nice segue, sorry. <laughs> our, our next speaker is, is going to be looking at some of the uh, more imaginative psychedelic imagery of um, Alice in Wonderland, which over the years has been claimed as uh, a kind of psychedelic text. Um, I obviously, my views, uh, my thoughts shift to the, the song White Rabbit immediately. Um, but let's, let's introduce Roger Essig. Now, Roger has, he's essentially an artist who specialises in um, visual representations of uh, psychological and psychedelic states. So he's also interested in the science of, of psychedelics too. So we, we could talk about that in the question time. But um, Roger has been a kind of authority on um, psychedelic or responsible responsible psychedelic um, <laughs> drug use since 1999 and since 2014 he's been showing his visualizations um, visual artworks that have have been based on representing these kinds of experiences in ways that many people can see what is essentially quite a subjective experience and so his work has appeared at white night rainbow serpent festival pause fest and many other parties and he's also given talks about the interplay of virtual reality reality with psychedelics and lucid dreaming as well. And um, he's spoken at um, Melbourne's Media Lab and also at Darwin Film Festival. Now, Roger has brought along his um, 3D, no, it's not 3D, it's, um, it's a VR kind of um, psychedelic experience. And if you're interested, um, it goes for only about Two, minute 30, yeah. yeah, a minute and a half, 90 seconds. And we have all had a go and it's tremendous. It's, it's wondrous. And it is based on an actual experience that Roger had. Um, but tonight he's going to be talking about the, the text of Alice in Wonderland and what that might have to do with psychedelic experiences. So over to you, Roger. Thanks, Mel. A uh, bit of housekeeping first, like literal <laughs> housekeeping. I have to move these glasses out of the way so I can actually see the screen. <laughs> I'll have my non psychedelic. My, I'll have my glass because I'm done talking now for a little bit. Is that yours? Yeah. All right. So as you can see, these are a few photos of me. Um, yeah, like in Melbourne, actually, uh, at a, various parties, and Alice in Wonderland kept cropping up. Um, the top left is an Alice in Wonderland party, like the theme party. I'm not sure who I am. I'm I meant to go as a pirate, but I ended up looking like Cher, because <laughs> I shadow one. But that's the, way, uh, the, um, the march here there, of course. There's me as the Mad Hatter at a chocolate-themed Alice in Wonderland party with a bit of, bit of chocolate on my nose. And at another party, I, this is what I, I usually do. I'll bring an art panel and I'll get people to join in and, and this formed. It was like a caterpillar. So actually... As I was painting it, it turned into the, the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland. So, yeah, it seems... Yeah, and if you think about the book, how, f how famous it is, and it, it may be due partly because um, end of copyright laws, you know, it, it could be reinterpreted or, you know, remade in various films and stuff like that. But the, the fact that it's so popular may be tied into, like, the mythical journey that sh uh, Alice went on because... You see other really famous books or stories. Classic one is, you know, um, Harry Potter, how that just blew up, you know. I think, is she more of a, uh, rich, richer than the Queen now? I think the, the author, I'm not sure. J.K. Rowling. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Incredible. I, that's what I heard, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but these stories seem to resonate so deeply, and I, I think that it is like a hero's journey that she went on. There is that tunnel sequence at the beginning, and... Uh, you know, ancient tribes people, they would uh, put their children or, you know, their adolescents into caves to let them confront their own demons and fears. So it's kind of like she's gone on this journey. Now, I don't know if uh, Lewis Carroll intended this, but it may be a fact that uh, this story sort of stood the test of time is because it sort of went that way and, yeah, people can relate to these hero journeys. So what's next? All right. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of theories about, and a lot of them have been disproved. So getting me here to talk about his potential use of psychedelics like Lewis Carroll or any sort of drug, 
all the, all the research I did came up, no, nah, it's been sort of refuted. He didn't really, there's no indication that he had opium for his medication, although this could have, he could have had, you know, um, definitely. Because uh, he did it is have migraines. headaches. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and some of the side effects, I mean, these were given to kids. As you can see, it says laudanum for baby too. So, they were, you know, people were giving like doses to, to children, and a lot of people were like mothers that have to work. So, some of them would actually dose their baby up and let them sleep all day, you know, sleep. Um, and so, when they came back, they were, you know, just a yeah, sleepy baby, I guess. Unfortunately, it didn't always work out too well because, you know, overdoses and stuff like that. So, so, um, so yes, there is side effects. Uh, with, although a lot of this was mixed with alcohol, so some say that the percentage wasn't enough to cause hallucinations and stuff like that. And by itself, opium isn't known as a psychedelic, really. Uh, but having said that, there, I think... It can be. You can access parts of your mind through just uh, stressful situations that chemicals do to your body. Uh, but it's not known as a psychedelic. Uh, what's next? So, yeah, in researching this, uh, I was looking for evidence of any indication that there was some... At least maybe uh, Lewis was inspired or knew about opium, which he definitely did. Uh, he was a really famous photographer, I guess he was called, or a really prolific photographer, and he took a, a lot of photos of his uh, peers as well, like other book writers, and there was a, a photo of uh, an author, and his wife had actually overdosed on opium, on laudalum, I think it was pronounced. So he definitely knew of people that, you know, uh, indulged in that sort of thing, because she definitely indulged in overdose and stuff like that. So, and also there was a, I'll get on to, it's a, a further ahead of the slide uh, about the author uh, Thomas De Quincey, who wrote Confessions of an Opium Eater, an uh, English opium eater. So I'll talk about that a bit later. But this was really interesting. This was his original artwork that he gave to Alice Little, the, uh, the girl, uh, the book that he hand wrote and drew pictures of. And this was, he called it a hooker, as you can see down there. Uh, but it, it wasn't really a hook, it was more of an opium pipe. And you can see this incredible artwork by, I think it was a wood carving actually, by Gustave Doré, who's one of the most prolific, I've, I've just sort of saw his artworks recently and he's done like, like thousands of incredible artworks this detail, so I recommend people look him up if they don't know him already. So yeah, the similarities are very striking, I find, like pretty much the same length, you know. And then you can see in the background, I think that was from San Francisco, actually, the, the top image. Uh, but again, you can see the opium pipe there, the length of that. So what's next? OK, and, and you spoke of this, the, uh, the headaches uh, that Carol um, supposedly had. And yeah, there was research done where, like a paper written about how he may have complained about these ocular migraines after the book had been written, but it says in one of the, it says it's the second time it happened, but he didn't mention the first in any, in any of his diaries. So there, there is, yeah, and it's up to de for debate if he had any of these specific ocular migraines. But yeah, in looking at this, I, I found it really interesting. It looks like a cat smiling, uh, if you, you know, tilt your head sideways at least. Uh, so what does it say? And I wish you wouldn't keep appearing and vanishing so suddenly. You make one quite giddy. So this is Alice. All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tail and ending with the grin, which, reminded, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often, often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat? <laughs> it's the most curious thing I have ever saw in my life. Uh, that's, yeah. So what else? Oh, yeah, so in another part of the book, she wrote, uh, Alice, uh, he wrote, when she noticed a curious appearance in the air, it puzzled her very much at first, but after watching it a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin. And she said to herself, it's a Cheshire cat. So in researching this, I, the, the images of this ocular migraine, they do last for several minutes, and they progressively get more vibrant. So 
th that sort of falls into a um, similar time frame as well. And you can see in the top right uh, the body distortions that that person's going through, the stretching of the legs and stuff like that. And again, it's always with these sort of curves. Um, is there anything else to add to that? I don't think so. But in a way, I'll, I will, I'll be talking about the appearance of the Cheshire Cat again and how it relates to psychedelics, which could be an opium-based vision. Not that, and this is my claim, that Lewis May never had had the experience, but he read authors that did. And he's known fan of, you know, as I said before, Thomas De Quincey, who wrote quite detailed about his experiences. And here, here it is. Um, Thomas De Quincey, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. So this is the, his description. I thus gave the reader some slight abstraction of my oriental dreams, which always filled me with a, such amazement at the mos monstrous scenery that that horror seemed absorbed for a while in sheer astonishment. Sooner or later came a reflux of feeling that swallowed up the astonishment and left me not so much in terror as in hatred and, ab and abomination of what I saw. Over every form and threat and punishment and dim slightness incarceration brooded a sense of eternity and infinity that drove me into oppression as of madness. Into these dreams only it was with one or two slight exceptions, that any circumstance of physical horror entered. All, but, all before had been moral and spiritual terrors, but here the main agents were ugly birds or snakes or crocodiles, especially the last. The cursed crocodile became to me the object of more horror than almost all the rest. I was compelled to live with him and, as was always the case, almost in my dreams, for centuries. Yeah, so it's like uh, his, his experience seemed like, it felt like centuries, obviously. So, And yeah, that's a, a common theme with psychedelic uses as well. I wasn't aware that opium gave that similar effect or that people had visions. So that's it's quite interesting. I escaped sometimes and found myself in the Chinese houses with cane tables. All the feet of the tables and sofas soon became instinct with life. The abominable head of the, the crocodile and his leering eyes looked out at me, multiplied into thousands, into a thousand repetitions, and I stood loathing and fascinated. And uh, in going through, I, you know, this uh, this is kind of a coincidence, maybe, or this is uh, the the second, well, the original artwork by uh, what was the? Uh, I forget the. Um, is it Tenniel? Yeah, that's Tenniel. the one. So, which would have been overseen, I think, by Lewis Carroll. Um, he may have. I'm not too sure about that. But. Yeah, he got very upset. When oh, really? The first edition was printed because oh. the the quality of the images were not up to scratch. Okay. Oh, yeah. So he's very yeah, um, fastidious with I don't know <laughs> yeah. if the word, <laughs> with yeah even the book quality like the paper that was used and all that. So he was very uh, careful with his, the final product. So this is the Jabberwocky. Yes, yeah. that's the Jabberwocky. So I found the uh, uh, this print of the. Thomas de Quincey book, and the similarities were quite striking. Mm. Um, and it's a common, well, there's the thing of chasing the dragon with uh, opium, which I always thought was a hallucination, like as a kid when I heard about that, or a young teenager. Uh, but I since learned it's more about chasing the smoke. It's, but then again, I think there is a dragon esque aspect to this, like people can see visions, and, um, and I've definitely seen dragon type of entities on. A, a substance called dimethyltryptamine, which is a, it's a common theme to see these sort of predatory animals. And it, and it may have something to do with, uh, which I'll talk about, in a, depending on the next slide, I always forget what it is. <laughs> ah, yes, it is the one I want. <laughs> so I've just heard recently, I've just found out recently about snake skin uh, detection, what humans can do and how we've evolved to be able to notice snake skin like the diamond pattern amongst uh, foliage, or even if like only a small percentage of the snakes shone, uh, it, we've uh, co-evolved with snakes. You know, when we used to live in trees, and I, I imagine the snakes were much bigger and we were much smaller. If you know what I mean, so <laughs> yeah. it, it may be. I mean, this is just a hypothesis. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, there's been a lot of papers talked about this, and they've done tests. Um, I won't go into the detail of the tests because I've only read them once through, and I can't really <laughs> remember. Uh, but yeah, they've used, they've tested on monkeys as well. They've never 
experienced snakes before, and they, they did see a, a notice um, reaction, I guess you could say. And I myself had an experience, and it, in fact, one of the f first people to write about this, uh, Lynn A. Is Isbell, yeah, she, why she researched this was she had an experience of being out and all of a sudden she realised she was jumping backwards from a snake and she didn't even know it was there. Uh, that happened to me like eight months ago, a tiger snake at a friend's property. Uh, I was walking down the back of the bush with two mates behind me and all of a sudden I was in the air pointing, yelling out snake and, and the snake and I jumped backwards at the same time. It was, and yeah, I didn't even realise it was happening until you know, after it happened in a way. So why I'm talking about this is, my theory is, or hypothesis, is on psychedelics or even opium, um, when you're drowsy and half asleep or whatever like that, uh, there's a hypogogia, I think it's pronunciation, hypogogia, the imagery that pops up as you're either falling asleep naturally or on psychedelics or opium. Uh, there may be something that triggers the mind. There may be something that there, there might be like a, a diamond shape or something that's similar to snakeskin patterns that it, it triggers the mind and then a full form appears, like the imagination takes over and goes, hey, look out, there, there's a snake there, and it fills in the details. So I'm not too sure about that. I haven't really heard about uh, people talking about that, but I just sort of put two and two together when um, hearing people talk about it. So, Ooh. yeah. So these are your works? No, the, the one on the right is by Alex Gray. Uh -huh. um, it's called Ayahuasca Visitation. And again, so all this relates back to Lewis Carroll in a bit of a tenuous sort of <laughs> uh, line, I guess you could say. He read Thomas de Quincey who talked about these apparitions appearing, just like the Cheshire Cat. So it may have given him some idea. You know, he, he might not even have been aware of it as he was writing, but you know, it, he may have gone, oh yeah, apparitions appear to people that are on opium. So that's my... Yeah, my joining of the ideas. So the image on the left there is of um, what I saw as I was smoking this substance, uh, which was extracted from the acacia tree. Uh, so it's called dimethyltryptamine. This was uh, in 1999, so 20 years ago now, pretty much. Uh, and I had no idea what was going to happen. So as I was smoking it, this, as I was, literally as I was smoking the substance, which is highly illegal, but I did it. I'm just going to lie and say I did it in a place where it was legal. So <laughs> um, it's not like this is being live streamed, broadcast no. or anything. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, this very wrathful sort of uh, creature came up, and you can see these, there is diamond shapes there. It was very reptilian, and it's a common theme. Uh, and I've actually talked well, communicated with Rick Strassman, a doctor in America, who in 1995 was able to do the first, or a bit before it, um, was able to do the first clinical trials of uh, dimethyltryptamine on human subjects. Um, and the first, it was the first to study on psychedelics since the big drug, drug war ban, I guess, of the, I'm not too sure what it was, but probably late or early 70s, I think. Uh, it took him two years to get approval, I think, or th nearly two and a half years. Uh, so I communicated with him, and he's actually used my artwork on some of his online articles, and so that's been fun. And th so this is one of the first um, artworks that, because I, I looked online, it's like, oh, there must be other people that experience similar things, oh, you know, using computer graphics to really get the detail, which I could never hand paint kind of thing. Uh, and so I made it and put it online and it went viral. And around the same time, Alex Gray did his version, which was called Ayahuasca Visitation. And we, so we hadn't seen it. We, it was like within a few, like a, a couple of months of each other. And you can notice the, the top, how there's that similarity in that uh, oval shape up near the third eye, I guess you could call it. Um, his is more animal, I mean, mine is more animal and his is more humanoid. But uh, yeah, it's some interesting, uh, Coincidences there, I think, and you can see the diamond shapes on the on the right hand side there. And here's a couple of other artworks. Um, uh, the one on the left is by Luke Brown, and I think it's called I can't remember the name. Sorry, Luke, if you ever watch this, but it's something about feline. So it is a cat type being that he saw on DMT, I, I assume. Uh, and then the one on the right, it's very snake-like patterns, uh, again, diamond shapes. And that was by uh, a guy who calls himself Titan Droid. Uh, so yeah, hmm, maybe Lewis 
Uh, yeah, was inspired by what he read in Thomas's work. So I'm not sure, but yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. Wow. Do you know, it, it strikes me that both Nick and Roger have presented imagery that has attempted to convey somehow what the experience, what a psychological experience is like for the person. Um, so Nick, when you were looking at Roger's pictures just now, um, did it strike you that this reflects anything to do with neuroscience? So, for instance, the symmetry is one thing that strikes me about those images. Yeah, I think it has to at some stage, at some point, and I think we, you know, we're... Uh, uh, we, we, we are pattern seekers, you know, our brains are all about finding patterns and we find patterns of things that are meaningful and our brains are probably pre-tuned in some way to identify things that matter to us and if you looked at the rightmost article that, um, that uh, Roger showed, it pointed out, uh, you know, snakes and, and threatening people uh, are sort of two very prepared objects of concern and so it's not surprising that we would see things which so resonate that with that in some way so uh, I mean how could it not be to do with psychology and neuroscience it's about experience mm. uh, it, it has to at some level so I think uh, the ideas are just fascinating I think that something that we've all tried to grapple with tonight is the extent to which Lewis Carroll or Charles Dodgson um, reflected his own experiences in the work. So you've looked at the migraine issue and, uh, Steph, you've looked at the, the maths issue and the kind of debates that were happening academically at the time. And, Roger, you've looked at uh, the background and the things that he might have been reading and the other texts. And when in my intro, I was also looking at all sorts of other things. To what extent do you think we can see the interpretations of Alice as being something that he intended? And to what extent are we reading into it ourselves? Well, I think the mathematics is definitely there. Yeah. Um, yeah. His, it, when he wrote about other things, what I've found out while I've been researching this, most of his other work that he wrote was really rather dull. Some of the other books that are in this, this lovely book that uh, my mother was given when I was born, um, um, are really dull that he wrote for children. It was when he was riled and angry and had something to say about the mathematics and the changes that were going against his classically trained mind um, and, and what he saw as um, the, the downfall of Euclidean geometry that he came up with these wonderful characters. Um, so, mm. yeah. Roger, a lot of your work is about subjectivity. Do you think that um, it's his subjectivity that we're reading when we read Alice? Hmm. Uh, definitely he's looking at... Uh, Definitely the mass comes into play, so there's definitely the objectivity of that. Uh, so, yeah, back to, you know, like this hero's journey, myth mythological. I mean, the way, the way I understand it is he made up the story as it went, you know, so he was kind of, um, you know, he just put this girl in a situation and, you know, just included a rabbit going down a rabbit hole yeah. and now he had to invent a whole pathway um, of what happens to her down there. So I think... In terms of that, I think he just let his imagination run wild and mm. it's just resonated. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the mathematical um, stories and the characters in, were added prior, after, yeah, oh, yeah. to so, after the, yeah. the story he initially told to Alice Little and the story that he gave to her. So the Mad Hatter's tea party, um, uh, some of the other things that happened. I only mentioned some of the mathematics as well. There's a whole bunch of oh, others. So if you want to come and have a chat afterwards, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know about the continuity principle and some of the inverse jokes that are in there as well. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, but I didn't want to overwhelm the audience. <laughs> um, but they were added afterwards. So the story that he told on the banks of the ISIS to Alice Little and mm. the book that he presented with his own illustrations didn't have all of the, the rest of these things and maybe the book would not have been and that's some of the commentary wouldn't have been um, wouldn't have stood the test of time if it hadn't have had these extra scenes in there that he added yeah Nick do you think that we're looking at one dude's vision or is it something that we are creating by reading it as well well it has to always be both but I know it's unfashionable to say that you know, authors' intentions matter, but I think you know they obviously do, and but and you don't need to choose between these ideas really. I think you know you can say, uh, in terms of the, the the tea party, you know, it, it illustrates a mathematical principle. You know, the plane, the things are rotating around it in two dimensions. That's a mathematical idea that reflects his his work. Um, you know, the fact that he's chosen characters who might represent people he comes across in his daily life that's deliberate. 
uh, the fact that he's got a mad hatter and hatters may be mad, you know, the fact of the general, this general weirdness uh, which uh, permeates all of it, which might reveal a person who's interested in alternative experiences, and I had another slide I cut, thankfully, uh, which is about, <laughs> he, he, had a, he, he was actually really interested in liminal experiences. He was a psychologist. He cared about trance states where you saw he thought fairies. You know, that's built into it as well, and that sort of comes through in his interest in this of psychedelic side of things, and maybe has a certain added reality, especially with the stretched human beings, with his personal experience of uh, uh, migraine auras. Uh, you know, that's all in there. Uh, mm. to be found. Now, of course, you can also impose your own subjectivity there. Not every interpretation is equally plausible, but I think there's a, what's great about the book, there's so many layers. That's right. It's interesting that you bring up the liminal states, because when you're talking about the, the hypnagogic state, um, a lot of other writers, for instance, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, have reported that they find um, some of their most creative visions coming when they're falling asleep or when they're just waking up. I know that I sometimes feel like some of my most exciting ideas come in those states where I, I'm not really thinking uh, strongly about these things. Um, so also the, the Edgar Allan Poe um, poem, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Mm -hmm. um, all right, <laughs> who would like to ask some questions? Oh, down the front we have, uh, we've got a roving microphone that's gonna come, so please put your hand up. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you're kind of touching on the area that I was going to direct my question about, and maybe to Roger and also to Nick, uh, because at the beginning, Mel, you mentioned that Roger would be referring to lucid dreaming. Well, and yes. He you, didn't yeah. actually get quite to it, but you touched on it just there a moment ago. So I'd like to hear what Roger had to say mm -hmm. about lucid dreaming and whether it has any connection with Carol's writing. And I'd also like to hear from Nick about the, the, the same, same matter. Right. Uh, yeah, I've, um, I've spoken about lucid dreaming uh, a lot, uh, I guess, with my artworks and um, publicly, and even just anyone that will listen. Can you um, explain what lucid dreaming is, if someone if sure, someone doesn't know? Sure. And this isn't in any way related to Alice in Wonderland. Uh, you know, I didn't have a connection there at all. It's just, yeah, that was just my intro that I talk about lucid dreaming. So, but yeah, uh, so you can train yourself. It's like a muscle. Um, there's various ways to do it. Um, it's the ability to realise that you're dreaming while you're asleep. So you actually have the realization, oh, I'm in my bed sleeping right now. But, it, and to test it, you actually pinch yourself and it hurts. So it's more real than real in a way. Um, and it can last a few seconds. If you get too excited, it can end. So there's ways to control yourself. Uh, I've worked out techniques where uh, I build in my short-term memory. So I'll glance at an object for two seconds. This is in the dream and glance at another object and do it until it, I build in a short-term memory of the environment and then it just locks in. Um, yeah, so it's fascinating. And then you can control your dream. To a, to a, it's like you have a, an, a higher ego or I'm not too sure of the technical terms. Uh, you can't just do anything you want. Okay. There's a, uh -huh. something that intervenes if you... Try like, well, you can't switch on a light, apparently. Like, I've tried. Like, you can't change light condition. It's like we don't have the processing power in a dream state to open a curtain and it'd be like if you try to open a curtain there'll be something shut behind it like your yeah. mind will protect wow. you from a, a change in light huh. which is interesting what's um, your what's your view on this nick i think it's fascinating i think you know the division of labor here is that roger has the experiences and i sort of write boring papers about them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you can uh, be trained <laughs> um, look uh, it, it's obviously it's obviously real and it's fascinating and at some level i mean this is Again, getting to the book, I, I'm afraid I know nothing about lucid dreams as an area of study, I'm sorry. But, you know, it's sort of a hyper lucid dream itself. It's a book about a dream. Mm -hmm. um, oh. It's all very dreamy. Uh, it's got all the elements that people like Sigmund Freud said dreams have. You know, things turn into other things without anyone really batting an eyelid. Um, things don't follow any kind of logical sequence. Weird things happen and, and, and we just have indifference towards them. And it's all been deliberately constructed by someone who's an author. So it's not dreaming strictly, but it's definitely dreamy. Mm. Do we have other questions? Um, I guess it was just a, a comment to extend on what both of you were saying. Um, I recently attended uh, a, a seminar about consciousness and uh, in that they were talking about a state that, um, that creative people and, and in, in the past, and, and from memory it was kind of contemporary to this person we're talking about, where they would um, go to sleep holding a rock and then when the rock yeah. dropped, they would wake so that they were there in that kind of creative moment when you've sort of 
half in sleep and, and half awake. So it's not quite like lucid dreaming, but it's you know that kind of twilight state almost that you get into, and that they would purposely do that to to aid their creativity and to to think differently. It can go both ways. I mean, there's other stories. One story about the popular belief of being abducted by aliens is that people are mistaking a state like that where they're actually their yeah, bodies are paralysed yeah. and sleep paralysis uh, with the idea of someone being abducted. So I, I'm not sure I'm going to play that game. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have perhaps any scientific or mathematical questions? No, Harry was going to say why um, maths is in, taught in an art subject. I did read about it, but I've forgotten. He will eloquently tell us all. Well, it's because um, uh, those of you who have studied maths at school, you've learned how to count and uh, how to uh, enumerate things. But that's not why people study maths, really. It's really about the foundations of logic. Uh, so uh, the study of mathematics is really about uh, uh, the principles that you need to establish uh, fact uh, and to uh, know when something is really true. And that's the foundation of modern uh, computing and uh, uh, computer algorithms and uh, decision-making uh, processes in computers. And in the middle of uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, uh, the corners of the Bodleian Library are divided up uh, into the original schools, schools of philosophy, schools of logic, schools of mathematics, and schools of uh, geometry, and uh, it really dates back to the 13th century. Amazing. It reminds me of how it, the old-fashioned term for science is natural philosophy, mm -hmm. and how maybe there isn't that much difference between um, philosophy and, and other forms of inquiry. No, well, mathematics is really just a language that we place on the world to understand it. And we set our own kind of schema or conceptual schema with numbers and that's just how we understand it. But if we decided, like when Alice is in the hallway and she does her, addition, her multiplication wrong, it's not wrong, she's just using different bases. We have base 10. Those multiplications are right, they're just in a different base. And if we'd not had maybe 10 fingers and had eight like the Simpsons mm. we would have used different bases and everything in our mathematics would be completely different today. Haven't different um, civilizations had different bases like the Babylonians mm -hmm. or something? Oh I'm hearing some authority from the <laughs> from the audience here. Do we have another question? So I'm I'm in two worlds because I'm a creative but my grandfather was a mathematician and he also studied at Oxford University my husband is a CFO. Mm -hmm. now, That's a chief financial officer for yeah. anyone in the audience <laughs> Sorry. that didn't know. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because knowing mathematic people that study mathematics, <laughs> now, I don't, and my daughter's a scientist as well, they are very hard to communicate. So they get frustrated sometimes to be emotional. So when I read um, the works of Alice, sometimes I think that he uses the characters to show emotion mm -hmm. where he's, because he's such a shy personality. And because they're so logical, they get frustrated because they can't feel what they want to say and they want it to be logical. Well, and I know that with my own husband. So I don't know what, I just, well, well, what I do you think? Well, I have an honours degree in theoretical physics my family is sitting in the back row there and they would say that I am quite emotional <laughs> and that I'm pretty good at showing it. So, um, but I think that um, Ale um, Lewis Carroll uses his characters, like I said before, as, as a way for him to satirise and to, to show his um, dismay and his frustrations at, at the changes that are happening. Um, and he does it in a way that, that is entertaining and that the people that were reading it that were in on the joke, as I said, um, would have really enjoyed it and had a bit of a laugh knowing that the rest of us didn't really know what, what was going on and they just thought it was a mad tea party that time was missing. Oh, that's strange, time's a person. So or had, so the, had, a pig turned into a, a baby turned into a pig. Well, that's the continuity principle. Sigmund Freud might have different ideas. Well, yes. 
But he had a way of putting it in layman's terms so everyone has had fun with what he wrote. And yep. that's the same with doublet. When he used words and changed words, I yes, love doublet. Yeah, so it's yeah. kind of really fun, you know. Mm -hmm. And I um, appreciate I loved your talk, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have to um, thank Harry for his help with my talk and Joe, who's up the back there, for the help with the slides as well. And just on what you said, uh, like when he was on the boat, uh, narrating this story to Alice uh, Little, uh, I think there was a, one of his mates or one of his mathematical friends. So he was telling the story to him too. I think mm. that's what I read somewhere mm. as well. So there was that. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more question. If anyone has a burning question. I can't quite see with the lights on me. <laughs> no. Um, well, I'd love to thank our three panellists for their very expert comments. And I hope that you've found um, a new way to interpret Alice uh, after this panel. Please join me in thanking Nick, Steph and Roger. <laughs>